Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments, where tonight we're going to take a look at AP Precalculus. We're going to look at the course, the exam, and how maybe TI Technology can help your students be successful. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach Algebra and Calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. And tonight, we are definitely lucky to be joined by two experts, uh, Vicki Carter and Todd Steckler. Vicki recently retired after teaching high school math for 46 years at West Florence High School. She's a former co-chair of the AP Calculus Development Committee and is currently serving as an AP Pre-Calculus Consultant. She received the T-Cube Leadership Award in 2015 and has served on TI Inspire authoring teams and has presented at many national, state, and local conferences. Vicki, it's really great to have you with us tonight. I'm really excited to be here tonight to share this brand new AP course, AP Pre-Calculus, with everyone. We're excited too. And Todd lives in McAllen, Texas uh, with his wife, Myra, and two children. He works in the La Jolla Independent School District. He's taught AP Calc AB and BC, as well as AP Stats for many, 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 many years. Uh, he's definitely looking forward to AP Pre-Calculus during the upcoming school year. This summer, Todd's been working as a college board consultant for AP Pre-Calculus by leading the AP Summer Institutes. Todd's also a TQ regional instructor for Texas Instruments and enjoys giving in-service trainings to fellow educators about TI graphing calculators. In his spare time, he follows the Green Bay Packers. Todd, great to have you with us as well. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm excited as well, just like Vicki. I will say uh, this is my eighth week of doing APSIs. It's been a great experience this summer. And uh, Vicki and I we actually sat right next to each other in Scottsdale, Arizona in February when we got trained on how to do these APSIs for pre-calculus, believe it or not. Well, that was destined, it was meant to be. <laughs> Vicki, will you uh, discuss our agenda for tonight? Yes, I'll be happy to. So right now we're going through the welcome and introductions of your three people here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what is AP Precalculus. We'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on the units that are covered and included in the course. There are also some mathematical practices that we want to make sure we share with you. The format of the exam. Um, and then we're going to do a little bit with technology in AP Precalculus. There are going to be some additional webinars where we get into much more of the technology and the actual units that are the material that's in the units that we have. At the end, we have a webinar drawing and some lucky winner will be able to get a calculator of their choice. All right, Vicki, thanks so much. And Todd, can you talk through uh, some expected outcomes for tonight? So sure, so when we leave here in an hour, uh, we will have ex explored some topics that will be in the AP Pre-Calculus course. We'll look at the format of the Pre-Calculus exam and then also understand some prerequisite calculator skills that are needed by students to be successful on this exam. Awesome, this is good stuff. So we'll be using the chat window tonight to send general messages. Uh, if you want everyone to see your message, including Vicki and Todd and myself, uh, send your chats to everyone is one of the choices. Uh, we'll also be using the Q&A window tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in that Q&A window. Uh, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. So Vicki, it is all yours. All right. Okay, we've had our introductions and this is our AP Precalculus, the course, the exam, and TI technology. And um, at the bottom of this first screen that we have here, you see the emails for both myself and Todd if you need to get in touch with us. All right, Todd, I'll let you go from here. Sounds good. 
So we will start off the uh, PowerPoint here. Take a look at the next screen. So about the pre-calculus course. Um, so a good introduction here. Uh, this is in the from the CED. Uh, we've highlighted in yellow uh, that maybe something that's different is that this course uh, could be a capstone experience for some students. This might be for seniors that might not take calculus. Uh, many times in the past, pre-calculus has been a course that leads into calculus, and that still might be the case, but we might have a group of students that uh, this is their, their last uh, chance to earn college credit for math in high school. And if we take a look at some of the prereqs, um, of course, we have linear and quadratic functions, uh, including algebraic manipulation, solving equations, and solving inequalities, uh, polynomial functions, um, solving uh, right triangle problems involving uh, trigonometry. Uh, this course uh, does not use degree measure. It only uses radian measure. So the degree measure is probably happened in a prereq somewhere, either in geometry or algebra two. Solving system of equations in two and three variables. Uh, working with piecewise defined functions. Uh, working with exponential functions and rules for exponents. Also some familiarity with radicals. Uh, working with complex numbers. And then also uh, working with multi-representations of functions, which has been a common theme with uh, Common Core in Algebra, both Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. And here's our, our Bible, if you will, for pre-calculus, the, the CED, the Course and Exam Description. Todd, I'm not going to um, try to pull it up right now, but this is, um, you need to go to AP Central and find the AP Precalculus under the AP courses and look at all the information that is there at, at AP Central that will give us, give you a lot of information. Highly suggest you download the CED so that you can reference it and look at it. Um, hopefully anyone that is teaching it coming up this school year has already downloaded their copy and has started doing some reading in Unit 1. That's right, and this document is 198 pages, so it is a big document. Um, people have asked in, in the uh, Summer Institute, should I print it out and make a hard copy? That's certainly a good thing to do, but it's a lot of paper. So some of the information that is actually in the CED, there's general information about just AP, um, and then there's course content. The mathematical practices are there. Uh, there are um, individual sections for the four units, and we're going to, in just a minute, get into what the four units um, com are comprised of. There are also instructional approaches and recommendations within this document. And there is a set of sample multiple choice questions, 24. That is not a full length test. We'll talk about that later tonight. But there are 24 questions there that you can look at um, that are multiple choice. And then the four free response task models that we have for the AP pre-calculus pre um, course. And we will look at a little bit on those later tonight also. So let's take a look at our four units. Um, the first three are actually assessed, and the fourth one gives you some fantastic information that you can use to work with your students on um, various topics, matrices, vectors, parametric equations, implicitly defined functions. We'll look at that in a little more in depth. Um, but a great opportunity to extend the learning in your students' um, um, AP pre-calculus class and perhaps even cover some of the state standards that you might have or district or regional standards that you might have. So let's take a look at unit one. Unit one is on polynomial and rational functions. 
I've kind of got groupings here as to how I might sort of think about putting topics together, maybe for short summative assessments even, but this is sort of how I would um, group the various topics that we have within unit one. The topics are numbered like one, 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 two, one, three, et cetera. So one, 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 two, one, three are all about rates of change. We're going to talk about how these input and output values change in tandem. We're going to talk about how to calculate rates of change. We're going to talk about change in rates of change. Um, and then we specifically in topic one, three, look at rates of change as they are related to linear and quadratic functions. Next, the, the grouping that I have here is for three topics on basically everything you need to do with polynomial functions. So we have polynomial functions and rate of change. Then we're going to introduce some work with complex zeros. And then we're going to talk about end behavior. And with end behavior, students will need to describe what the polynomial function is doing using limits, good limit notation. Uh, calculus teachers will be cheering that. Then we go into our rational functions. We have basically four topics here that talk about various things about rational functions. Again, in behavior, and this will be described with limits. We have zeros of rational functions. We have a topic on vertical asymptotes, and then one with holes. Todd, if there's any point here that you need to mention something, please jump in. <laughs> I'll just add that uh, the way Vicki has grouped it is exactly the same way that I would group it. So we're uh, definitely on the same page with, with these groupings. Thanks, Todd. And then the last four sections are dealing with, now let's do equivalent representations. Uh, we get into, um, synthet not sy we do, don't do synthetic division, we do long division in order to find our vertical asymptotes and our slant asymptotes and investigate things with our polynomial and rational expressions. We get into a wonderful unit on transformations of functions, and then we have function model selection and assumption articulation, which is a lot of words to spit out there and then function model construction and application. This is where we get into some of the contextual problems that would be associated with polynomial and rational functions. Then we'll move into unit two. And unit two is all about exponential and logarithmic functions. So first we investigate change in arithmetic and geometric sequences, and then we relate that to our linear and our, um, exponential functions. So a nice tie-in with the sequences and the functions that we have. Next, we'll get into everything about exponentials. We'll talk about exponential functions, exponential function manipulations, then we'll do con text and data modeling, and then competing function model valid validation, where we'll get into, you know, what are we looking at a model of exponential functions or quadratic functions or linear functions or other various polynomial functions. We then have a little short grouping of compositions of functions and inverse functions. This could, of course, be taught at the beginning of this unit if you prefer to do that, but this is a nice lead in to our group of logarithmic functions that we have that are, of course, inverses of exponential functions. So our everything about logarithmic functions, we have logarithmic expressions. We're going to talk about these inverses, um, these logarithmic functions that are inverses of exponential functions more on graphing with the logarithmic functions. Again, we will see limit notation to describe in behavior, and then we do our logarithmic function manipulation. This is basically where your laws of logarithms are going to come in. And then our last little group is where we're pulling all of this together. We're going to solve equations and inequalities, 
Again, we're going to have some context and data modeling with logarithmic functions, and then we have semi-log plots. Semi-log plots have scared a lot of people because you may not have seen it in a very long time. You may not have ever taught it, um, but there is um, going to be some help that you will have on semi-log plots. And of course, if you're attending an AP Summer Institute, that is one of the topics that we do spend a little bit of time on. I'll just chime in on a couple things. Um, so section 2.6 competing function model validation. That's a, a very interesting uh, topic. And it's also one that can maybe be brought in in, in unit in unit one as well with polynomial uh, functions because uh, basically this is talking some with regressions uh, using um, the calculator. And so there's no reason that some of this information can't be brought in sooner if it applies. And frequently students in Algebra 1 and 2 have done linear regressions with data, and so at least that part of it would be um, familiar to them. And I agree with Todd, you may want to bring that in earlier just so that they've already seen the linear quadratic regressions in, the, in Unit 1 before they start exploring the exponential and logarithmic regressions. Also, I did see something in the chat about synthetic division and just how apparently at, at one of the APSIs, uh, synthetic division was maybe frowned upon. Uh, I, I would just like to say I would never frown upon synthetic division. I think it's a very important skill. Um, it's just that it, it can't stop right at synthetic division. Uh, I think it, it needs to get extended through um, long division with, with applications of, of maybe finding slant asymptotes, of things like that. And so I think synthetic division is a tool, and as a teacher, I'm gonna still teach it, but it's not something that's gonna be assessed directly on the exam. Yes, and I just saw a chat, long division first and then show them synthetic division. That's a great idea. They need to see the relationship of synthetic division to what that long division process is. And it's pretty easy to show them, the students, if you have a long division problem sitting there and then you can relate the synthetic division to it. Or is there anything else on units one and two that we need to take care of in the chat before we move to the other two units? Vicki, I saw something in the Q&A from, I think it's Teresa. Um, Teresa wanted to know if you're planning on trying to create summatives that are gonna look like AP questions, like use the AP classroom, or just make sure that they'll have a good understanding of math skills in those standards. Um, well, obviously, we're as, as a teacher, I would do summative assessments. Um, AP classroom is going to give you a lot of um, help, especially with formative assessments. Um, I will mention this, uh, the way the formative assessments, the what we call the personal progress checks, the progress checks that are not graded, that students can complete in order to assess themselves and to help the teacher know where the students stand. Um, in unit one, it falls at the end of the exponential um, topics. I think that's one six. I might be wrong on my numbers. And then there's another one at the end of the unit that would assess the student's understanding of both exponentials and logarithmic. Uh, same thing happens in unit two. There's one about midway, and then there's one at the end. I'm just going to piggyback on that in that um, when I'm giving my, my summative exams, I'll use unit two as my example. I am anticipating having uh, two summative exams uh, for unit two, one right in the middle and then one at the end. And, and my summative exams will, will look very much like a mini uh, AP exam in that uh, one day I will have some multiple choice questions that are, are pretty similar to what they're probably gonna see on the real exam. And then the second day, um, it, it'll probably be two free response questions. One will be a calculator active question and one will be a, a non-calculator question. So uh, that's the way I anticipate doing it for, for all of the uh, summative exams. Yes, and I and I totally agree, Todd. I, I feel like you should have multiple, well, multiple parts to your assessments, your summative assessments, calculator versus no calculator questions, and then multiple choice type questions versus the free response type questions that you might have. 
All right, Todd, I think you're going to talk a little bit about unit three with us. All right, so unit three is the trigonometric and polar functions. So, uh, so topic 3.1 is kind of off by itself, periodic phenomena. And then the, the next group of uh, topics deals with uh, sinusoidal functions. So that's topics 3.2 through 3.7. So that's a, it's a big, uh, big topic, a little bit of tangent in there, but the majority of it are sine and cosine functions. Yes, Both. tangents defined in topic 3.2, and then we kind of leave it for a while. We'll come back to it in a few minutes. <laughs> for sure. And then uh, 3.8 through 3.12, so here's the tangent function back, along with the inverse trig functions. Um, section, uh, topic 3.11 are the, the other trig functions, if you will. And then uh, 3.10. Uh, trig equations and inequalities. So one thing we notice about 3.10 is is there was something in uh, unit two as well on solving equations and inequalities. So there's quite a bit of consistency here. And then also 3.12, so writing equivalent expressions in trig functions. We've seen that before with uh, log functions and also exponential functions. And our um, that is actually where your identities show up. And so the identities that they need to be familiar with are going to be your Pythagorean identities, your sum and difference, and your double angle identities. We do not include the half angle identities. So um, there, and since this question probably will come up, there are no, um, there is no formula sheet with the AP pre-calculus exam, just like there's no formula sheet with AP calculus. So they will be responsible for knowing like the properties of logarithms, properties of exponents, and in this case, some of the identities that I mentioned. And then the last three topics of unit three um, are related to polar coordinates and, and polar functions. And so uh, this is a topic that uh, maybe in, in previous years, one of the things that teachers ran out of time to cover, uh, but it's, it's assessed, it's in unit three, so we know it's gonna be assessed quite a bit. And as a BC calculus teacher, I can tell you that three, topic 315 just really excites me that students are going to be exposed to the rates of change with polar functions. For sure. All right, and a quick look at unit four. So unit four is not going to be accessed on the AP exam. So every single APSI this summer has asked, why are these topics not going to be assessed? Why are they even in the course if they're not going to be accessed? And so there was a decision made um, last November at, at a meeting of all the the important people that were making decisions. And a lot of the college professors at places across the country uh, decided these topics are not in their college pre-calculus course. And so since they're not in that course, they shouldn't be in the respective AP pre-calculus course either. Um, so parametric functions, along with implicitly defined functions, conic sections, and then uh, implicitly defined functions with uh, parametrization. So I can tell you um, as, as a, a BC teacher, uh, I'm gonna teach most of this stuff and I'm gonna teach most of it before the exams takes place. Uh, my, my method of doing it is, is I like to do parametrics uh, real well. I like to do vectors very well. And then once those are done, then I'll get into polars. And so I don't anticipate um, my, uh, scope and sequence changing that much, but again, everybody has to make their own decision when you're you're setting up your your plan for the year. And then this next grouping would be uh, vectors, along with uh, matrices. Um, and so uh, a lot of the prerequisite skills for matrices have been covered in Algebra Two, but some of it is here along with uh, linear transformation and matrices. Matrices is functions, and then matrices modeling context, which many students have never seen before. Very, very good mathematics if there's time to cover it. Thanks, Todd.
Okay, so right. before we start into the mathematical practices, are there again any questions that we need to address? I've seen lots of things coming across the chat. Um, a little hard to keep up with it. <laughs> All right, so the three mathematical practices. Um, so mathematical practice number one is procedural and symbolic fluency. And so uh, this practice has three skills in it. Uh, so skill 1A is solving equations and inequalities analytically with and without technology. Also, uh, 1.2, which is expressing functions, equations, or expressions in equivalent forms, um, both uh, in a mathematical or applied context. And then 1.C, constructing new functions using transformations, compositions, inverses, or regressions that may be useful in modeling context criteria or data, both with and without uh, technology. So since we are doing a Texas Instrument webinar in which we're going to share a little bit about the calculators with you, although the majority of this webinar is sort of an over, overview of the AP pre-calculus course and exam, I wanted to highlight where we are going to be able to use technology. And so that would be in 1A and 1C. Real quick in the chat, Renee, I can answer that. Um, can students use the CAS 2 on the exam? Yes, they can. Uh, no doubt about it. Another question in the chat was, what about universities and college credit? That's really up to individual universities. They have to make that decision. We hope it's it's yes, but the, each university will make that, that choice for themselves. So I've always told my students, even calculus students, which is, you know, while, while, while well known across many colleges and universities and credits awarded for various scores. I've always told my students, go to the source, go to the college, find out, go to their web page. If you can't find any information on the web page, contact the college and find out what kind of credit they may give you. That's going to be the best bet. We just can't make generalizations about what credit is going to be awarded and whether they will or won't, et cetera. All right, multiple representations. Um, this has been very popular, as Todd said earlier, about looking at um, like our polynomials, our rationals, our exponentials, our logarithms from four different means. Graphically, which we do fairly often. Numerically, that means we're basically looking at tables of data or information about the particular function. Analytically, that's kind of the classic way functions have been presented. And then verbal representations. And so these will be used to answer questions and construct models, again, with and without technology. So you will see technology being used to identify information from functions. The next is constructing equivalent graphical, numerical, analytical, and verbal representations. So we identify and construct, again, both with and without technology. Our mathematical practice three is communication and reasoning. Those of you that are very familiar with the AP Calculus mathematical practices know that what we've basically done is combined the last two, there are four mathematical practices in AP Calculus. Here, there is no mention of technology because we really aren't working with technology in the communication and reasoning. We might have used technology to reach this point, but now we need to be able to verbally describe characteristics, apply numerical results, and support conclusions and choices. And so students will need to know the terminology that's in the um, AP Precalculus CED, course and exam description, and be able to communicate appropriately and give reasons for their answers. Okay, the exam format. Um, I did put a link here in case you wanted to visit that. Again, if you just go to AP Central, you will be able to um, find a lot of information about this course, and I just put the website there. 
So, um, Mike, yes, I, th I saw that question come across. It's um, your Pythagorean identities, your sum and difference um, angle um, identities, and your double angle identities. If, if anybody's interested, I, I have what's called a trig identity toolkit. Um, if you, I'll, I'll have my, my, you've got my email on the, on the front uh, of this uh, presentation. So if anybody wants a copy of that trig identity toolkit, I will certainly send it to you. You might find it helpful. Okay, we wanted to, thanks Todd. We wanted to briefly describe what the AP pre-calculus exam will look like. So the multiple choice will be 40 questions. The students will have two hours to complete this. And this is not a 50-50 split. This is going to be 62.5% of the exam score that the students will um, get. So there is a part A and a part B. Uh, part A is going to be the cal uh, no calculator multiple choice questions. They're going to be 28 no calculator questions and the students will have 80 minutes to complete those. Then part B will be 12 questions. The students will have 40 minutes and this is where the graphing calculator is required and a good many of those questions do require the graphing calculator in order to find the answer that is correct. So just a quick chime in on, on where these percentages are coming from. So part A, the multiple choice non-calculator is 28 questions, which is 28 points. And so it's 28 points out of, to out of a total of 64. Uh, 64 points because the multiple choice is 40 and the free response is 24. So if we take 28 over 64, uh, that'll give us 43.75%. And then for the part B, that's 12 questions or 12 points out of 64, and that will simplify to 18.75%. Thanks, Todd. And then we have our free response questions. Um, again, it's in two parts. There will be four questions. They are six points each, one hour. So we can do our division again and get 37.5% of the exam score. Part A is with the calculator. So they'll have two questions with the calculator, and then they will have two questions where the calculator is not permitted. These are called task models because they are very specific in the tasks that we're going to ask the students to complete. FRQ1 is always gonna be function concepts, and it will come from units one and two. FRQ2 is gonna be a modeling question, so it's gonna be contextually based, but it will be a non-periodic context, again, coming from units one and two. Then they'll move to part B. They've put their calculators away. They will have FRQ3, which is coming from unit three, and this is modeling a periodic context. And then FRQ4, symbolic manipulations, and this will be, um, questions that are coming from units two and three. So we're going to take a little closer look at the free response questions. And note when the calculator is required for the first two questions. Okay, so this is just a summary and this is some information that was shared with us as consultants that we have in turn shared with our participants in our AP Summer Institutes. Um, in the question STEM, this is the information that the students have to work with to answer the three questions that they will have that are labeled part A, part B, part C. They are going to be presented with two functions. One will be analytically presented, the other one will be either graphically or numerically. That means a table would be given. The questions will involve working with both of the functions. These are coming from units one and two. So we have our polynomial, rational, exponential, and logarithmic functions that may be, that may show up here. Um, so this is calculator active. They should be able to graph functions, solve equations, Graphically, finding points of intersection, finding zeros, and evaluating. And one of the skills you, you'll definitely need to work with with your students is um, storing values on their calculator so that they retain uh, a value as opposed to just jotting down, you know, what they see in to, to three decimal places, or three places after the decimal, um, and and not having accuracy in their final answer. Um, each part, part A, B, C, is worth two points. 
um, they are going to be asked to do some of these things. Uh, function composition, working with inverses, talking about input output value, zeros, in behavior, note using limit notation, and identification of an appropriate function type. And this is basically going to happen when a table is given. Part C, remember um, mathematical practice three, they're going to have always have a reason point that will require them to demonstrate knowledge of some pre-calculus concept. And so I would just add um, some good advice that, that we've gotten this summer is uh, when students have access to a calculator to do things that really the calculator is needed for. And like on part C here, it's a reason point. So students are going to have to write something which probably won't use the calculator much. So that might be a good time to put that off until the, the last 30 minutes where students don't have the calculator with them. So someone asked if the FRQ is going to always be in this order and the answer is yes. The first one will always be on, on this function model that we have. All right, FRQ2, this is still with the calculator. Todd, I can't remember who we decided was going to talk about this yep, one. That's me. So this is okay. going to be an, an application problem. This is modeling um, with that's not periodic. And our, so it'll be a lot of reading. This question has a tremendous amount of reading. It's either going to come from uh, unit one or unit two. Um, so since if it, if it comes from unit one, it could be polynomial. Uh, it could also be piecewise. It could be a mix of fun function types. Could be exponential. It could be logarithmic. And just like on the previous question, uh, good advice about storing information using uh, the store function. Uh, the breakdown of the points is this is the one question that's different. So questions one, three, and four, the breakdown goes two, two, two. Part A is two, part B is two, and part C is two. Question two is different. It goes a two, three, one breakdown. So part A is two points. And what students need to do is um, find the values. Uh, they have to set up some a system of equations. And then once they have the equation set up, they have to solve for the parameters. So those are going to be the two points there. Equation set up and then finding the parameters. Uh, part B is three points. And so there's going to be a calculation piece, an apply interpret piece, and a reason piece, all involving some way uh, average rate of change. And um, if you are familiar with the calculus exam, uh, usually these questions involve a difference quotient and also involve units because it's a contextual problem. And then part C um, will involve a problem with the probably domain and range, maybe some limitations that exist based on the, the way the function is defined. Okay, so now the students have put away their calculator and they'll move on to questions three and four. They will be able to come back to one and two if they have time. They just will not have their technology. So FRQ3 is our contextual with a periodic function. Um, again, there's going to be a good bit of reading. There may be a figure to help describe the periodic nature of what is in the context with the reading that they do. Um, there, the students will be able to determine the amplitude period, vertical shift, and phase shift from the context. So when you get your CED and open it and go to the four sample FRQs, I think you find that the sample that's in the CED is about a fan or something that's spinning around like a fan. Um, they, the first part, so this is a 2-2-2, two, 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 as Todd was explaining the points set up for the other two, the first two. So this is part A, two points, part B, two points, part C, two points. In part A, there's going to be a graph shown that will be two complete periods of the function. It will either be sine or cosine. And they are going to have to put coordinates on five points. So based on the contextual information that they can derive from the 
paragraph that's the stem of the question, they should be able to label the X and Y coordinates of those five points. And then they are going to identify A, B, C, and D in A sine of B times X minus C, close parenthesis, plus D. They're going to identify the A, B, C, and D, could be sine or cosine, and um, this is to help them make that relationship between uh, the symbolic representation that they have and from the STEM details in the context that they're reading. Um, the third part, part C, is two points. This is always going to focus on a specific interval between two of the points that are shown on the graph. It's going to be about rate of change, and then they're going to have to have um, another piece that is uh, dependent again on that interval. So both of those two points will be on that interval that is selected for the students to describe what's happening to the graph of the sine or cosine function. Let me just chime in. Uh, Lori posted in the chat about um, the T plus C versus the, the X minus C that a lot of people use with transformations. And we we'll just have to trust that there's going to be multiple uh, answers that will be acceptable as long as students are consistent. Um, and so I guess the, the biggest thing is is you be consistent in your teaching, just like I'm going to try to be consistent in my teaching. And I think Which I students... think I, <laughs> Todd, I think I wasn't because it just rolled out of my mouth the way I've always done it. So I have to be very conscious of the X plus C, and I think I misspoke just a second ago. Thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they will not have a choice between sine and cosine. Um, they have, they will be told which one it, it will model. And so they have to make sure that they get the correct um, and probably the phase shift is what they're going to be dealing with the most in order for it to match the function sine or cosine that the FRQ asked them to use. All right, FRQ4. Um, first of all, we weren't sure we wanted to include this, but we did. So, Todd, I'll let you kind of speak to that. So, these directions kind of give students a, a, a guideline on, on what is meant by simplified expressions. So, the, the verb simplify is not going to be included, uh, but for people that are familiar with the AP Calculus exam, uh, on Free response questions that are non-calculator, if a student has an, a simple expression like uh, sine uh, pi over 2 uh, plus 3, they can leave it like that and they'll get full, they won't get docked any points at all for that. On the pre-calculus exam, that would not be considered a simplified expression. So everything has to be in, in the simplest form without using the word simple. Um, I think teachers know what that means, but uh, the uh, AP College Board people didn't want to include that word simplify just to not, uh, but they did give examples of what uh, acceptable forms of solutions would look like. And this, this direction box gives us some good examples of those. And this is only for FRQ4. So this set of directions in this box will be at the top of the page for just FRQ4. There are going to be general directions for all of the FRQs, but this is very specific to FRQ4. Uh, so, Lori, to answer your question, natural log of, of, one, of three halves would be perfectly fine. Now, where we would get in trouble is if we had natural log and inside of the parentheses there was an E somewhere. That would not be a simplified form. So, uh, looking at FRQ4, um, so this is a very, going to be a very traditional FRQ. It's going to be a pure math question. Uh, the functions are coming uh, from units two and three. So they could be exponential, logarithmic, uh, trigonometric, and also inverse trigonometric. So just put a note there not to, not to skip the inverse trig stuff because it's still important. It could come out in an FRQ. Um, uh, the point values uh, for part A, um, it's either going to have students solve uh, an equation or to rewrite an expression. So part B will be the, the other one. So if part A was a solve, uh, part B will be a rewrite or vice versa. If part A was a rewrite, 
then uh, part B will be a solve. And then part C will be another solve. And uh, this will um, be about finding all of the solutions. And so if you uh, think about with trig equations being solved, a lot of times we have to put uh, the plus uh, 2n pi um, to include all of the solutions. And with n has to be being defined to be any integer. And so um, I know a question that's come out a lot of uh, times this summer with, with solving equations is, uh, do we have to include uh, uh, notations about domain? And so just like with calculus, a lot of times with, with solving differential equations, a lot of times in the model solution, the domain is included. Uh, our understanding is that the same thing here, um, it's good at practice to put any domain restrictions, but many times uh, those are not going to be graded to lose a point. So it. Um, all right. So let's see, Vicky. Do you know this answer? Uh, practice FRQs that are coming to AP Classroom right now. There's very little there. Um, but uh, I highly recommend you going through the formative um, FRQ types because they are. I mean, you will see patterns of like what we talked about here. If you pull out your four FRQs that have been released and then start looking at the formative open-ended type questions, you're going to see a lot of parallels. So you've you've got that already and definitely I would absolutely make sure I assigned the formative problems to my students. There will be two sets in each unit, one, two, and three that you can use. And they're under the progress checks. I always called them the personal progress checks. I think that might have been terminology that we picked up in AP Calculus when AP Classroom first came out. All right, obviously, again, we are in a Texas Instrument webinar, and so we want to talk a little bit about technology. Todd, do you want to handle this one? Okay, so the uh, in order to, to teach an AP course, um, schools and districts have to agree to have calculators available and so uh, students should have these uh, calculators available to them, to them on a daily basis both in the school and also at home and uh, hopefully the school is able to hold up uh, their end of the bargain and so, so go ahead yeah the technology no go ahead todd so uh, what are some different things that that students should be able to do with their graphing calculators of course, perform calculations, graphing functions, analyzing graphs, using table of values, finding zeros of functions, intersection points of graphs, max and min of functions, uh, finding uh, solutions to equations in one variable, using regression equations. And then uh, this is new this year, uh, plotting uh, residuals. And, uh, something that's traditionally a statistics application, but it's working its way into pre-calculus. And this is, they will use the residual plots to determine which function type uh, they need to consider for the data that they are presented with um, that they've done the regression on. So they might have to try a couple of different regressions, like maybe a quadratic and an exponential, look at the residual plots and decide, um, you know, which which is more appropriate. All right, are there any questions we need to um, address before? We're going to try to do a few problems. We may not have time for all of these, but we wanted to demonstrate a little bit with the calculators. Um, and Todd, we might have to pick and choose. We don't have a lot of time. So um, let me get out of this and bring up the next thing. So I think maybe Vicky, we should skip over the perform calculations part and okay. just go right into the graphing. All right. So Mary Jane, you ask a question. What's the recommended calculator? Um, so Vicky and I, we we kind of do this a lot, a lot. Um, we give presentations on calculators. Uh, for me, um, if, if there, money isn't an issue, um, 
the the Inspire would be the way to go. Uh, I just think it's it's a 21st century calculator, and, and I'm not talking bad about the TID4. It's just that it doesn't have the capabilities that an Inspire does, in my opinion. So someone did mention the online calculators. This, these are the online calculators. So I've kind of minimized the window so I could bring them up side by side. So uh, we're going to do just make sure that you know how to create a table of values. Um, so I'm going to graph this function that I've got here. So X squared and, and you might end up laughing at me a little bit because I am an Inspire user and every once in a while I fumble really badly with the TI-84 even though I used it for years and years. You just kind of forget. Uh, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. You remember how to ride the bicycle but you might not be real good at it. So, so I'm going to look at the graph first of all. So we have a classic parabola here but I want to look at the uh, table of values and so I am going to go to second graph and this will show me a table of values. Um, I can change the setup, but right now uh, the screen that came up, I think I was playing with it earlier, is showing me table of values from negative six um, input to four input and I can scroll up and down to see other values there. But that's how simple it is on the TI-84. Let's see, Vicki, can oh. you show the calculator? It's not showing up on your screen. It's not? It's not. Okay. I know why. Hang on one bit. I've got to, I got to stop sharing. I've got to do something else. I'm sorry about that. I know what I did wrong. There oh, it's it there now? Beautiful. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, my fault. I didn't click, click on the right window. All right, so far, let me see. So there's our y equals, sorry, there's our graph. So I just click graph and I'm just using a standard window. And then I did second graph to show the table of values. So with the Inspire, um, I am going to go to number two. I think I am going to go to number two, which is add graphs. And again, type in the same function. Now I have, um, I'm using the, the alphabetic X key, but they are highlighted on this um, online version so that they're a little easier to spot. So we have X, uh, we have a squared button, or we could use the caret for our exponent. It's going to either or here, uh, minus 3X plus 5. And when I select enter, I will have my graph, and if I quickly want to look at a table, I can go to Control T, and I get a split screen, and there's my table of values. Again, I can scroll up, see the same values that I have on the TI-84, scroll down, and there are ways to change that setting so that you can see other table values, or you can have different increments with your inputs. You can also have it where you ask, so you could have your own inputs and then see the resulting output. Um, so Todd, we can probably do either graph and find uh, zeros or we can do an intersection. Let's uh, see if we can do an intersection. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go back to my Y equals um, button here on the TI-84. Um, I'm going to clear that and retype this new function. So 2x, of course I am going to use the caret key for cubed and I need to make sure I move to the right to get out of the position of the exponent. Minus 3x plus 5 and I'm going to press the down arrow because I want a second function. 2 minus x and I will look at the graph. I only have one point of intersection, so I want to calculate that point of intersection. It is under calculate that's with trace, so second trace is going to give me calculate. I want an intersection point. It asked me for my first curve. Okay, it's sitting on the blue curve at the moment. That's good. My second curve, now I'm on the red curve. That's great. 
and then it's going to say guess. So what I want to do is move my little cursor fairly close to the point of intersection. I'm going to select enter and there's my point of intersection. So one of the things that you might want to do is practice storing this. Um, same thing on the TI Inspire. I am going to actually just add another page by pressing control doc. I'm going to go back to graphs. I already had a function in Y1 or F1 of X, so I would input my two new functions here, 2X cubed, again, right arrow to get out of the exponent position, 3X plus 5. I'm going to press the down arrow just like I did with the 84, 2 minus X. I'm going to press enter. I have it here. Now I am menu driven on the Inspire. So menu, I want to go to analyze graphs. And oh, my fingers went too fast. Sorry. <laughs> and I'm still doing it. I'm in, a, I'm like rushing. I'm sorry. Analyze graphs. Number four is our intersection. I'm just going to hit the safe side and they hit that. It asked me for a lower bound. That means I need to move my cursor over to a place that's to the left of the point of intersection. Then I'm going to move my cursor over to the right of the point of intersection. And there's my point of intersection and my little functions in the way. So we'll move him down. And we do not have the accuracy that we had on the 84, but wait, I can hover over this and press the plus sign and I will get more digits. That is super fast and I'm so sorry, but we're kind of at the end of this. So I am going to stop sharing. Hey, Mike, it's Thanks all so yours. <laughs> Thanks so much, Vicki and Todd. Um, I know that was quick at the end, but uh, rest assured that everyone attending tonight will automatically get a follow-up email, which will contain links to the documents, the recording, uh, which is going to be helpful that way you can pause and rewind as necessary as well as a certificate of attendance in case you miss it so we did promise that one lucky winner is going to be receiving a ti graphing calculator of their choice and tonight's lucky winner is jennifer mowers so jennifer congratulations uh, start turning those wheels and thinking about which ti graphing calculator you'd like to receive To receive a certificate of attendance for the webinar tonight, go ahead and click the link that just popped up in the chat window. Also listed as a link for the documents from tonight. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. In case you're missing any of these links for any reason, uh, or maybe they're not working or what have you, uh, again, you're automatically going to get a follow-up email with all the links you need, the recording, the certificate, and the documents from tonight. If you need any post-webinar follow-up, feel free to give us a call, 1-800-TI-CARES, or drop us an email at ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. When you leave tonight, your feedback is super important to us, and you'll automatically get a survey that will pop up in your browser. Um, I think we did mention that we were doing a few more of these uh, AP pre-calculus webinars this fall. The next one is on August 29th, um, and it really does help us to know uh, what we're doing well and what we can do better on. So uh, please feel free to leave us that information in the post-webinar survey. Huge thanks to Todd and Vicki for everything they shared tonight. Uh, I know there was a lot of information, um, but hopefully uh, it was all good stuff. So thanks so much for everything you guys prepared for tonight. You're quite welcome. Very welcome, for sure. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you back online next week. Have a great night.